That's what Adam Smith was talking about in The Wealth of Nations, where he said the public good is promoted best by the private interest. By the way, how much beef and potatoes do you think New York would New Yorkers would have if it all depended on human love and kindness? <laughs> I'd be worried about them. <laughs> Let me give you another example of, you know, some people say, well, Williams, instead of using the term greed, why don't you say, since you're trying to win friends and influence people, why don't you say enlightened self-interest? I think greed is just a little more descriptive. <laughs> Let me give you another example of the virtue of greed or self-interest and private property rights. You know, I have often said that I don't care much about future generations of Americans. You know, future generations. And sometimes people look at me puzzled, just like some of you are right now. They're saying, Williams, how come you don't care about future generations? And my response is, what have future generations ever done for me? <laughs> I mean, a kid that's going to be born in 2050, what has he done for me? And if he has not done anything for me, how then am I obliged to do anything for him? Where's the quid pro quo? <laughs> but if you watch my actual behavior, my behavior would belie that sentiment. A number of years ago, I took about two or three hundred dollars that I could have bought two nice bottles of Chateau de Cam Sauternes wine that I could have consumed selfishly all by myself. Nobody else would have enjoyed it except me. But I took that money and bought some seeds, uh, seedlings, some small trees, some trees for my uh, property. Now, when those trees reach their full maturity, I'll be dead. There'll be some 20, 50 kid swinging in my tree eating my apples and my pears. <laughs> Mrs. Williams has made extensive improvements on her house, built a nice sunroom. Now, that sunroom is going to outlast us. And there'll be some 20, 50 kid tracking mud in my sunroom. <laughs> now, you might ask the question, what's at least part of the reason I sacrifice current consumption to produce a good that's going to outlast me and benefit a future generation, well, the answer is very easy. The nicer my house is, the longer it will provide housing services, what? The higher the price I get when I go to sell the house. That is, by promoting my own self-interest, I can't help but make a house available for future generation whether I mean to or not. Now ask yourself the following question. Would I have the same incentive to care for the house if the government owned the house? Or would I have the same incentives if there were a 75% transfer tax when I went to sell the house? No. Anything that weakens my private property rights in the house weakens my incentive to do the socially responsible thing, conserve on the scarce resource of our society. Let me just give one more example. You people look like nice people. I don't know whether you're nice or not. <laughs> but some of you could be concerned about the extinction of various species of animals. I don't give a hoot. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a practical matter because according to biologists, Everything, 93% of everything that has ever lived on earth is now extinct. And I say, why quibble over 93.5 or 0.6%, you know, what the heck. Um, some of you are concerned about, you know, the extinction of the bald eagle. And let me just tell you a story about that. It's just a short story. You know, I was 35 years old when I saw my first bald eagle. I was looking at the critter in the Philadelphia Zoo. I was asking myself, could I have gone another 35 years without saying that? I, I said, yeah, but, but I understand. <laughs> different people have different values. Anyway, the crux of the story is that a number of years ago, I was listening to NPR, and people were picketing the UN because uh, they were concerned, you know, picketing various countries that are members of the UN, because they're concerned about the extinction of the white rhino or the extinction of the gorilla or the extinction of a... Uh, of, uh, of, the, of tigers, elephants, and, and as people were forming various clubs like 
Save the Whale Club, Ducks Unlimited, and stuff like this. <laughs> and so I wrote down the list of the animals of the people who they are in the tizzy over. I wrote down the names of the list of the animals. Then I wrote down another list of animals that are very valuable to us, but nobody's in a tizzy over them. I said, how come people are not marching for the chicken? <laughs> how come people are not forming pig clubs? Well, what's the essential difference between these two lists of animals? Well, this list of animals, cows, sheep, chickens, and pigs, they belong to somebody. They are the private property of somebody. It's in somebody's personal private uh, interest to make sure these animals are, are cared for. The other list of animals, whales and, and elephants and et cetera, et cetera, they don't belong to anybody. Nobody's personal private wealth is at stake. So those of you concerned about very, uh, extinction of various animals, uh, you should make some effort to try to privatize them. <laughs> Well, let me begin to close. Um, now, this, the, despite the virtues of the free market that I've just commented on a few of those, and never mind the fact that the rise of capitalism brought about a more humane society, that is, the rise of capitalism brought better treatment to women, better treatment to racial minorities, better treatment to the handicapped, better treatment to the criminal, better treatment to the insane, there's considerable hostility towards the market. You know, I was giving a lecture at a college, giving the same lecture at the college one time, and um, a feminist stood up. And she said, Western capitalism is offensive to women. And so I asked her, I said, well, if you're a radical feminist, what country do you want to live in? Uh, would it be uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, Afghanistan, you would want to live in the United States, or at least in the West, a Western country. And, or if you're a criminal, where do you want to go to jail? Is it Mexico or Turkey? You want to go to jail in the United States so you don't miss your HBO shows in the afternoon. And one of the reasons why, which is the subject of another lecture, why the rate rise of capitalism brought about a more humane society was because before the rise of capitalism, the means to wealth was by uh, looting and plundering and enslaving your fellow man. The rise of capitalism made it possible for you to become wealthy by serving your fellow man, by pleasing your fellow man. That's why Bill Gates is a multi-billion dollars. He pleases his fellow man. And if you look at wealthy people, super rich, they make things that their fellow man voluntarily buys because he's satisfied. Anyway, despite these virtues, there's considerable hostility. And there's broad hostility towards the market, even by people who call themselves conservatives, or and liberals and Republicans and Democrats. Um, almost every group in the nation has come to feel that government owes them a special privilege. Manufacturers feel that government owes them protective tariffs, that is, keep foreign goods out so they can charge you and me higher prices. Organized labor feels that government should keep their jobs protected from competition from those who are not union members. Intellectuals, college professors, think government should give them money to do uh, various kinds of research. You know, college professors love to get money, $500,000 grants to do studies on poverty, and meet in a nice hotel in Miami during the uh, winter to talk about poor people. Uh, if you ever see a group of conservatives arguing among themselves, you can bring instant peace. Just talk about uh, conservatives rail against food stamps aid to families dependent children, legal aid, but they come out in support for aid to dependent farmers, aid to dependent banks, and aid to dependent motorcycle companies. <laughs> Conservatives as well as liberals, Democrats as well as Republicans prove H.L. Mencken's definition of an election quite correct. H.L. Mencken, for those who forgot, he was a political satirist for the Baltimore Sun. 
And somebody asked H.L. Mencken to give a definition of an election. And H.L. Mencken replied, uh, he said, government is a broker in pillage. And every election is an advance auction on the sale of stolen goods. <laughs> now, to the extent that H.L. Mencken is correct, and I believe he is, we've identified our problem as a nation. Now, many of us will blame politicians. And yes, we can blame them a little bit for not living up to their oath of office. But ladies and gentlemen, the bulk of the blame lies with you and me, the American people. That is, politicians are doing precisely what we elect them to office to do. And what do we elect them to office to do? We elect them to office to take the property of one American and deliver it to us in some form. Now you say, well, look, William said, that's an insult. And not we Pennsylvanians. <laughs> well, imagine I'm running for the Senate. The United States Senate in the state of Pennsylvania. And I go back and forth across state. And I say to my fellow Pennsylvanians, look, I've read the Constitution of the United States. If you elect me to the Senate, don't expect for me to bring back aid to higher education, meals on wheels, uh, prescription drugs, highway construction funds, because these are not enumerated in the Constitution. Do you think I would get elected to the Senate from Pennsylvania? No, I wouldn't. Now, here's the tragedy of it, ladies and gentlemen. That Pennsylvanians would be acting absolutely correctly in terms of their economic self-interest. Why? Because if I don't, as senator, if I don't bring back money, billions of dollars to Pennsylvanians, it doesn't mean that Pennsylvanians will pay a lower federal income tax. Oh, it means that New Jersey will get it instead. So once legalized theft begins, it pays for everybody to get involved. And those who don't get involved wind up holding the brown end of the stick. For those of you with a rural background, you know what I mean. Now, let me close by saying that if the founders were to come back today, see today's America, I think they'd be very disappointed. They'd be disappointed in our choice to accept what we see as safety in exchange for liberty. But the optimistic note for me, and it should be for all of us, is that it's not too late for us to wake up. That is, Americans have never done the wrong thing for a long time. We always manage to get our act together. But, ladies and gentlemen, we have to get our act together while we still have the freedom to do so. Thank you very much, and I'll entertain questions.